and welcome back to another exciting episode of Breaking the Ceiling. This is where we go behind the brands and see the people who've made them into the successes they are. Today, we have a very unique brand and a very unique person uh, that I want to talk to you about. This drink has never been you know, made uh, in, on a large scale in India before, even though it's a uh, you know, drink of the royals. Uh, the drink is called Mead and it's made by fermenting honey, spices and fruits. And uh, today I'm going to be interviewing Rohan Rihani, who is the co-founder of Moonshine Midri. And he's become very popular uh, over the last few days and you all know why. So, hey, Rohan, welcome to Breaking the Ceiling. Thanks for having me on the show, Ashwin. Really do appreciate it. So, uh, tell me a little bit about Mead, right? So, it's not a mainstream drink. So, where did this start? What What was the inspiration behind so the yeah firstly let me talk about the beverage itself right mead okay. is the oldest alcoholic beverage known to mankind it predates beer it predates wine by we don't know how many thousand millennia because uh, both beer and wine require systemic agriculture to make at scale okay whereas mead uh, can actually occur in nature by mistake by accident as well like imagine ancient hunter gatherer man wandering the plains of the African savanna, right after a thunderstorm, there's a tree trunk which has fallen, uh, which had like a beehive inside it. It's filled with water. Uh, the falling rain mixed the honey with the water. While these fermentation starts, ancient hunter-gatherer stops, drinks from it, and he's like, whoa, this is sweet, and it gives me a kick. So the first meat, you didn't need any human intervention for the first meat to come about. And um, how we came about it, uh, a lot of human intervention here, is uh, Nitin, my co-founder, he was working with McKinsey at that point of time and he was flying from one European city to another. And in the Lufthansa in-flight mag magazine, he read about uh, London's first midri in the last 500 years. And uh, he's like, this is damn cool. He just sent me a couple of pictures. And uh, when I saw it, I was like, this is super fantastic because both Nitin and I are history buffs. So we're fascinated by anything which is historical. And of course, we're fascinated by anything which is alcoholic. So then uh, those two passions combined, you get moonshine. And uh, huh, that actually, I'm going to use that in the future. <laughs> and uh, so we just looked at this and we were like, this is interesting. Why not? Let's just try getting some and trying it in India. And so we went to all the wine shops here. Apparently, no one knows what a mead is. I'm still now, it's a rare thing. But we were quite like, what is this? Like, how is it that no one knows about it? read more, found out that it's still made in Europe. It's still made in uh, Eastern Europe, especially. Uh, but overall, across the world, meads had kind of died out. But there was a resurgence happening, especially with craft mead in America. But of course, we didn't have access to any of it. And we like, the only option might be to actually make it ourselves. Then uh, queued the whole uh, making it at home part of our journey. Again, no intention to start a business around this, but just wanted to make a product and try something for the first time. It's like you read about a nice recipe and you're like, huh, I can, you know, let me try making this at home. Uh, it was pretty much that mentality. But it got to a level where our friends were like, can we buy a few bottles? And that's when the light bulb went off in our head, more like the cash register, right? Uh, and we're like, there's potentially a business around this product. And uh, after a lot more testing, a lot more trial and error, uh, we realized, and of course, a lot of Excel sheets, uh, which now are meaningless because, you know, how no plan survives first contact can be, right? Same thing, no business plan survives first contact with the market. And uh, we finally realized that we want to start this. Uh, we went to the excise department, uh, got permissions changed, got laws changed to allow us to exist because at that point in time, Maharashtra excise did not allow for fermentation of honey. And so at the time, the excise department, super progressive department, uh, they're like, oh, this is what you want to do. So the law doesn't necessarily allow this, but sure, it makes sense. It will stimulate beekeeping, beekeeping will stimulate agriculture. Uh, you know, there's a very clear correlation between what you guys want to do and agriculture. So yeah, makes sense. Let's do it. And uh, of course, it takes time as with everything else. Uh, so we incorporated the company in Jan 2016 and launched the product in the market in Feb 2018. Yeah, in the duration of this, I did a course in beekeeping. I went abroad and interned with some midris, uh, took our product from here to, like, I can't wait. You can't see it in the camera. And uh, did all of that. And we are where we are because of a lot of those learnings. Uh, and yeah, Feb 2018, we launched in Bombay. 
uh, a few months later we launched in pune a few months after that in goa and for the longest time we for about nearly 2 years we remained a maharashtra and goa only brand we didn't want to expand out and we did in 2020 that was the plan and then we all know what happened and so now we finally expanded in 2021 end is when we've expanded to karnataka to assam to rajasthan uh launching in himachal pradesh in another week and maybe another state as well after that yeah so that's a it's so interesting to see that how a quick read on a aircraft triggered out a you know something this way right yeah. and so how do how do you and your co-founder know each other how tell me about that so, how did yeah. you guys find it uh, so the actually i i normally like to start the story this way the story of moonshine starts in 2014 when nitin first read about it but the reality is the story actually started in 1987 when nitin and i first became friends so our fathers used to work in the same factory together and uh, we were living in a town called haldia near kaikata and that's oh. when nitin and i first met we were probably 3 years old and we've just been together since then both our fathers got transferred at the same time to bombay so we both moved to bombay at the same time they both got transferred to pune at the same time so we both moved to pune at the same time so uh, nitin's first job after engineering was back in uh, bombay my second job was in bombay and so we both ended up living together in bombay again so our paths have always kind of like our lives have kind of slammed us together many many times and so the friendship has uh, sustained so it's been super awesome to work with your like oldest friend because uh, trust levels are insanely high communication is so simple uh, don't have to worry about hmm, what will he think if i say this i mean i don't care what he thinks so, like i will say whatever i have to <laughs> and vice versa so oh that's awesome so this is the actual chatty buddy oh yeah in the in the truest sense of the word yeah in the truest sense chatty buddy yeah. right so that is that is phenomenal and it's so um, you know refreshing to see a friendship that turns into you know a business relationship and i think that those kind of relationships and those businesses will thrive because of as you correctly said open communication you know just trust that you don't have to worry about what somebody doing behind my back yeah. because you know, i think your friendship will outlast the company and will outlast everything else you'll do together right so yeah, yeah. i think that is that's just a very very solid story and a solid team yeah right? so when you start with this process for you guys like did you guys figure it out do you hire somebody who knows bead making how does that how does that play out so all by ourselves i'm kind of uh, quite proud about this uh, we have done everything by ourselves we figured out how to make it how to filter it how to i mean ferment it first how to filter it how to package it how to hold carbonation uh, how to pasteurize uh, all of these things are things we've learned on our own we've had a bunch of uh, misses along the way a bunch of failures along the way but uh, for example bottles kind of you know didn't didn't have any idea of product stabilization in the early days so yeah uh, while i'm talking to you i'm getting like ptsd flashbacks but <laughs> yeah but a uh, lot of fun to do nonetheless i mean the journey has been incredible and we we had consultants along the way to try and help us make stuff but we, what we also realized is that because no one has made meads before in the country on a commercial level uh, a lot of these learnings a lot of consultants who came in from beer or wine they didn't necessarily know what to do either like so we finally took a call that you know we might have developed this knowledge base in house and of course i've stayed in touch with the people in the us where i interned and uh, early days of course there was a lot of back and forth a lot of knowledge sharing and that's one thing i really enjoy about the craft industry where no one's hesitant to share knowledge no one hesitant to share best practices and uh, so yeah it's been great uh, learning from them. that is awesome that this is where you intern that still in touch with you you know you're still in touch with them you guys are sharing notes i think that's just fantastic so uh, before munshan midri both of you hadn't started a business and you all yeah. were working somewhere corporate so corporate how space. was the experience of the business in the food and beverage space in india what was that like so uh, i think for me because i worked in small and medium businesses uh, it was easier for me Nitin, I think, had it much tougher. I remember when he first quit his job. Uh, his last job was with he was an associate director with Abbott Pharma. So I remember the first day of moonshine where he joined. Uh, he called me. Like uh, he did his normal morning routine. Got dressed, wore his crisp white shirt, his trousers, put on his black shoes. 
and sat at his dining table in Bombay and then called me up and said, yeah, now what do I do? <laughs> so, uh, whereas I was in the habit of like never wearing jeans, only wearing shorts and like flip flops. And uh, so it was like when worlds collide. Uh, and even now, now I think Nitin's loosened up a bit. I think he's gone, he's become a little bit more relaxed with how he approaches day to day. Uh, and I've gone the other direction. So we've kind of found a mid ground. And that's been pretty cool. But uh, especially getting into the FNB space has been fascinating because I think two reasons. A, we're both new to the world. We're both new to this universe. But at the same time, there is a joy in making a product which people consume and you can see people's reactions, you know, uh, whether good or bad. But in our case, I'm quite happy, like mostly positive, right? I imagine it's what a chef would feel when someone tries their food and appreciates it. Right? So it's many small versions of that throughout our journey in the last four years. And it's quite, uh, it's quite nice. But of course, the challenges of understanding distribution, uh, just figuring that out, understanding how to market this product, those have been uh, challenges to say the least. But still, a lot of learnings, a lot of fun. Uh, and yeah, we're, we're still learning. Every day we learn something new. So I think that, that applies to almost every business. Because when people leave a, a you know, well-paying job and they get into business, they expect so much glamour around it. This Because, you, you know, you see the glamour side of business, you see the glamour side of CEOs and founders. But what you don't see is the blood, sweat and tears and the PTSD that goes behind yeah. all of the, uh, the front that other people see. Yeah. Right. So now uh, I'm, I'm assuming your team has grown. It's no longer just the two of you. Now you guys are a, a bigger team. So when you all started like hiring... How was, how was that experience? So one thing we, one little metric we had while hiring was that we want to hire people who we could sit and have a meet with or a beer with. You know, we can sit down and converse with outside of work. And I think that really helped because that also set the culture of the company in the early days. And uh, a lot of our initial hires actually weren't even like, okay, we need to hire someone. It was people who just wanted to intern with us who people in college who were like, can we just come hang out? And we're like, yes, free labor. Right. And, uh, so that, that association became, uh, people just stuck around. I think people identified with our team, identified with what we were building, the larger vision of it, uh, the overall socioeconomic impact that what we do can have, you know, that's the last scale, long scale 10 year vision that we have. And people have just stuck around. So, the same people when they graduated from college, they were like, can we, I mean, it was, it was like a no brainer. They, they knew that like we, we were waiting for them to kind of join and we knew that they're going to join. And that's how most of the initial hires were. And uh, it's been pretty fantastic. The culture's pretty awesome. And what happened is these few, these first people, the first 10, 15 people have, have almost become the, I would like to say they become the propagators of culture, right? Initially, the culture stems from the founders, but then the initial team, it's important that they understand the culture and they imbibe it because they're the ones who are going to spread it down further for the, for the next few hires as well. And we've seen that happen. And we're super pleased about it. So what is something about people that surprises you? Like with your own team or just in people in general? Okay. This is a, I did not expect that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what is, what is it about people that, that okay, uh, I'll tell you what, something that I realized a couple of years ago is that every single problem in running a business is finally an interpersonal problem. Okay, uh, and that was pleasantly surprising because once you realize that most things are interpersonal problems, then you know how to solve them. Like, it, then it's about, it's about human relationships. And uh, those are while those are challenge, challenging, those are also quite straightforward and quite, you know, it's not rocket science. You just need to have open communication, be able to take and give feedback uh, quickly and uh, dispassionately, not bring ego into the relationships. And uh, if you manage to do all of those things in the work setting as well, I think it just creates for a great working environment. So That is fantastic. And by the way, when you said open communication, that brings a very you know, a uh, close bell with me because that's one of our core values. Right? Nice. We okay. practice communication and uh, 
But that one little core value has completely changed the way interpersonal issues get solved within the organization, the way innovation works. So one of our mm. core values is also, you know, we make thoughts into things, which is a like, let's, you know, we innovate quickly. But okay. one of the ways that we innovate and that we recently innovate quickly is because we have open communication. So if there's a shit idea, we tell people, hey, that's a shit idea. And it could be the VP, it could be me, our intern can tell me, hey, that's a shit idea. And yeah. that's perfectly, perfectly normal, it's perfectly fine. Uh, an intern can come up with an idea and be executed at, you know, a national scale. Right? Yeah. So uh, there is no meritocracy, but that open communication actually fuels a lot of that. So I'm so glad to know that you guys practice that at, you know, uh, your organization. So when you started, right, and you started getting a team and you started developing some, uh, you know, what is it called? Momentum. Hmm. Did you ever find yourself... Uh, you know, worried, I, what did you find yourself with an existential crisis that, hey, if this doesn't work, everyone goes home. Like, did that ever cross your mind or was it just like a smooth path to success or did oh, you no. ever let like, that no, no, cross your mind? It, it's, uh, so the pandemic wasn't kind to us, right? Uh, we're a, finally, we're Alco, we're very dependent on the channel. And uh, <laughs> once, uh, we, we can't do e-commerce. And so once uh, the pandemic hit, we actually got drawered quite like, badly and so uh yeah those thoughts crossed our mind and uh, honestly it, it crossed our mind pretty much on a daily basis uh but the team's been great in the sense that during the pandemic we had to in institute some pay cuts we had to go into an austerity mode and uh, the team was understanding and supportive there were people who we hadn't planned for pay cuts but people volunteered and said like and that i think kudos to the team that some people actually came up, most people came up and said like, hey, I can take a higher pay cut, which was pretty fantastic uh, because we're also very open with our financials. We don't we don't say like uh, only the operations part of what the team needs to know. We tell the team everything about our financials, about pretty much everything in the running of the business, how Nitin and I are thinking about problems, how we're trying to solve them. And so that buy-in is there from everybody. And so because everyone's so bought in and uh, has been so bought in, they understand the problems and they're willing to sacrifice time, sweat, energy, and in this case, even money, okay, to basically make sure the team sustains and survives and goes through. Uh, we didn't lay off a single person during the pandemic, uh, even though, let's say, production was shut for months on end. Uh, a lot of the production uh, team went home, uh, but we continued. We, we waited for them. We paid them throughout the pandemic, and once they were back, we hired them back again. I mean, they just hit the shop. It's good. Yeah. Oh, wow. that is that is phenomenal. I think that kind of culture is very unusual in India, right? And it's a little bit more in the US. I've seen this kind of culture, but in India, it's almost unheard of. Right? Uh, so tell me a little bit about some of the myths that are associated with the alcohol industry. That you get to drink every day. I mean, it's true. Okay. <laughs> it is true. You can drink every day. But I think the real question is, should you drink every day? <laughs> so, yeah, but uh, uh, I think uh, it's not all fun and games. Sorry? Do you drink every day? So I'm, I also look at production. So it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> you have to taste every day. Right? It's quality control. It's quality tasting, yeah. But no, in all seriousness, uh, today we're bottling, uh, we're bottling our guava chili tomorrow. So today uh, we're adding the bhut jaloke chilies to the, to the mead. So, multiple taste trials of how much Bhujjulok actually should go inside. So lab skill trials of that were going on. So yeah, I've I've consumed before noon today, I must have consumed about 100 ml of alcohol, but it's all less than 6%. It's all spaced out. So it's not, we're not getting hammered at work. Uh, there are times when you have a nice buzz going by 9.30, uh, but those are, those days are rare. Uh, but one, one myth is that it's not all fun and games, right? Uh, even pulling off an event or pulling off like a product launch, there's a lot going on behind the scene and it's it's grueling at times. Uh, especially with a small team, uh, till about till just before the pandemic, Nitin and I were there at every single event, picking up kegs, cleaning up after the event is done, uh, setting up stalls. There, there are events that Nitin and I have done ourselves and I was telling someone this yesterday that I remember this one event in Nasik in 2019. It was just Nitin and I. So Nitin was serving customers and I had to carry like a 60 kg keg back from the cold uh, reefer van to the venue. And so like I'm rolling slash dragging slash kicking a keg across maybe like 200 meters. And I don't think I can do that anymore. But 
in the moment you're so you're so charged up with adrenaline like you don't think of any of this and you're just doing all of it but it takes a toll on your body and it takes a toll on everybody like the dia now we have more people so it's i guess it'll be easier uh, but yeah early days was just super grueling right. so tell me about now this is the run on your on the personal side tell me about few of the habits that you have inculcated that make you a better leader that make you a better founder co-founder interesting i read a lot i think for me uh, that is one of my what i believe has made me who i am okay because i read voraciously and i read across uh, sectors there's pretty much nothing that i do not read and uh, interestingly i've always been fascinated by human psychology and i think i'm glad i was uh because i think all of those learnings are something i can apply in those interpersonal relationships i was talking about earlier and so that's helped a lot but besides that i also i'm not an, i don't have an mba degree okay so i do not have an mba in marketing and like in fact i'm handling the marketing function for the company it's interesting because i feel that not having the mba degree has liberated me to think outside the box because i have no holy cows i have no mm-hmm. things must be done this way uh and in in fact if someone says hey this is the way we used to do it so that's the way we should do it my first response is let's just explain it on first principles basis and if it still makes sense then we'll do it otherwise i'm not going to do it just because somebody else has always done it and i think that's allowed us to do a lot of things which other brands would not typically do for example uh we're we're available in nature's basket and if you walk into the wine sh- uh, the wine section of a nature's basket for most of the nature's basket you'll see on the floor there will be a 2 foot by 2 foot sticker about moonshine and there will be some funny line or something and uh, when we first proposed it uh, i remember uh, someone we were uh, someone who was uh, like a mentor slash like a friend of ours who's from the icobab space he's like uh, are you saying that you were okay with people walking over your brand okay and we were like yeah why not like cuz the floor is cheap as opposed to the walls okay so <laughs> and it just surprises that no one does floor branding so i think we're the only icobe brand that's doing floor branding in nature's basket everybody else wants to be on the walls and we're like okay. everyone's looking where they're going so it makes sense for us to be on the floor so that's great oh that's a lovely lovely example of how education can you know put these blinders on you and just make you look like in a certain way yeah. and you just don't outside it so uh, a few years ago i was sitting with a friend of mine uh she's one of my mentors for uh, pr and uh, she runs a fantastic very successful tech brand and we were just comparing notes on mbas right and what out of the mbas we are using and i was actually telling her that hey i have not used anything out of my mba you know in day to day work hmm. so she's like no 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 last week i used swot analysis So I was like, oh, for for acquisition, for you know, for what were you looking at for? Hmm. She's like, oh, uh, breaking up with my boyfriend. Confidence <laughs> going. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, that is insane. <laughs> so and people sometimes put so much weightage on you know formal education hmm. that they forget that the real education is when you do things with your own hands, like things you learn. Yeah. You know, like education is ten times more than a formal education, right? Yeah. So, so now let let me come to learning. Now, you as an entrepreneur, uh, you said you read books. What are some of the other forms of learning? Like, where else do you learn new things? I used to during the pandemic, and even before, I used to listen to podcasts a lot. I used to listen to audio books yeah. a lot. Yeah. But uh, right now, man, it's just come down. I just, uh, I think there's a, there's an overall information overload that's been happening over the last few years, especially. And so, I've consciously over the last few months taken an effort to cut down on the information inputs that I have. and i'm currently i have whittled it right down to books again and i'm only reading books again maybe a couple of youtube videos once in a while but i'm going back to the basics and then when i feel like i'm a little settled i'm going to start adding on a layer of podcast cuz i really enjoyed podcasts earlier i i i used to start my day with podcast my morning commute was podcast evening commute was podcast uh but the pandemic kind of like threw a wrench into all of that especially the second wave after that i was like i don't need any additional information so i'm just reading books right now that is awesome so i think books are one of the most underrated sources of learning and especially if you read books on uh, people their biographies yeah right it's a person telling you about his life story telling you the you know trials and tribulations and what method what did they do and what mindset they were in hmm. it's like 
having you know if you get that chance to sit across somebody and them telling you all this experience that's yes. that's a 350 to 500 rupee investment that you can get yeah. you can invest 10 you know 10 20 hours and get that information yeah so i i used to read i've almost read all the biographies and all that but i, I used to always you know uh, uh, pressurize myself that to finish a book so uh, recently for my morning runs i started listening to audio books mm. because i don't get as much time so i maybe read half an hour 45 minutes a day or there i should read more mm. but then at any time i would just have one book so now uh, reading this book uh, i was listening to this uh, audio book by uh, naval ravi khan yeah. it's called the almanac of naval ravi khan so one of the my key takeaways from that book uh, on the audio book was he's like hey, at any given time i have 20 books open yeah. he's like i am under no pressure to finish a book i will read a book i will find one point yeah. that the book is about all the remaining book is just stories trying to you know justify that one point and once i get that i just leave the book i write down the one point and i move on to something else right so that was such a fantastic learning for me and now i actually have six audio books i have five books open on my desk i have six audio books yeah. i have a few more pdf files on my pc where i've been taking a little piece of something and then applying it in business yeah. right and i think that that has been a real game changer for me over the last few that, that was one of the best books the almanac of novel ravi card is one of the best books i've read in recent years i loved it it is just phenomenal the way that guy yeah. thinks is just at a, at a you know very different level so tell me about uh, somebody who inspires you huh. that's interesting <laughs> <laughs> i uh, can i give you examples of brands that inspire me yes of course uh I think two brands come to mind. The first one I'm going to have to say Brew Dog. Okay, Brew Dog is this Scottish uh, craft brewery, and they've actually opened a tap room in Bombay as well. Uh, they launched. Oh no! Yeah, they're in Kamla Mills, I believe. Uh, when they launched, <clears throat> two guys in home brewing in their garage. Uh, they had a dog. Uh, they named the company Brew Dog. Right? It was as simple as that. But the way they did marketing, and it was so much guerrilla marketing uh, for us because we're a, a upstart brand, you know, we're a challenger brand competing with some of the big boys. We actually get shut down by the big boys in some accounts we go to, right? Uh, because they're like, no, you can't have them. So uh, suddenly we see our sales plummet, like from one month to the next. Suddenly sales go to zero because the sales ma- the purchase manager is like, yeah, like sorry. uh they told us that if we kind of buy you that they won't sub sell to us and we have to buy them so sorry you guys are out and uh surviving in this in this ecosystem where the big boys are like ruthless uh and you know still getting the word out there i think brew dog has done such a fantastic job uh, of creating brand evangelists from their customers itself uh they did something called equity for punks uh, where they actually got their own customers to invest in the company and uh So they raised a couple of million dollars, and also created a couple of million like evangelists for themselves. And I think just the way they think so out of the box is just super fantastic. They of course now have migrated away from their punk roots. Of course, they're maturing as a business. But I think the early days, how they went about marketing, is just like a great case study for anyone who's like a challenger brand, so to established industry. That is awesome. And which is the second one? You said two. Brew Dog. Yeah. I really admire what Bira has done. Okay, uh, mm. Bira from creating a brand, of course. Okay, I think Bira has done a fantastic job in brand creation. Uh, they took on like a behemoth like Kingfisher, uh, and they did what they had to do to try and break the back of Kingfisher. I, I wouldn't say they've succeeded, but they've carved out a niche for themselves. They carved, they made a dent for sure. and uh, of course they've raised the boat loads and container loads of cash that they needed to to actually take the fight to kingfisher uh, but they actually did it and because bira did what they did i think they created a, a space a vacuum and an understanding in the channels mind and the consumers mind that uh, more flavorful beverages can exist you don't have to be Uh, oppressed by the tyranny of commercial lagers and uh, i think while they started the narrative i think we have picked up that mantle and we're just running with it now so uh, we're all about flavorful beverages uh, at some level so is bira uh, you know they themselves have talked about more about making play with flavors that's very much in line with what we're trying to do as well so i think bira is a great benchmark for us to kind of also pit ourselves against also awesome. 
So while we are talking about raising boatloads of money, you guys did raise a round or two? We raised a few rounds, all angel rounds. Okay. Uh, the first few, of course, were friends and family and some fools. Uh, then the rest okay. were angel rounds. That's okay. the most common ones. Sorry, more common ones, yeah. <laughs> the friends, family and fools yeah. round, yeah. And then we've had a bunch of angel rounds. Uh, we haven't had an institutional round yet. And uh, okay. uh, we're looking for one at the moment as we speak, so... So while you are doing, see the friends, family, fools, I think is the easiest one. They're the closest people to you. So that is relatively easier. Yeah. But when you the whole angels round, how how was that experience? Was there like how many people did you have to meet till you got people to, you know, put money in? Like just so because I know a big challenge in India. Yeah, big right? challenge. Even though people say it's more of money, it is a big yeah. challenge. I'll tell you. Uh, I think the second round that we raised, or the third round that we raised, which was super memorable for me because how we raised it was uh, just so. It's. I think it solved the problem. It showed the investor that we're solving a problem. And uh, so we were at a networking dinner where a bunch of investors were there. Some through our contacts, we got to be one of the beverage partners. And Nitin and I turned mm -hmm. up not at the at the investors' lounge. There were a bunch of investors, and they're all kind of talking amongst themselves. And Nitin and I are just working the crowd. Have you tried this product? Like it's a new alcoholic beverage. We're not saying we want money. We're pitching the product. And. Uh, I remember this one gentleman who runs a, a quite a decent sized VC fund, tech base, of course. Uh, he came up to us and he like, man, this is fantastic because he like, I don't like drinking beer. He like, I can't stand beer. It's bitter. And he like, I like cocktails. But he's like, in India, in a man's world, when everybody else is having a beer, he like, it's a little awkward having a colorful cocktail in your hand, no matter how tasty they are. And uh, he like, I know there are many people like me out there. So he like, you've given me a product which is flavorful, which is tasty, not bitter, doesn't make me feel bloated because it's gluten free. And it's in the shape, like, which is acceptable socially. And he like, I see the problem you're, you're solving. And before we left that night, we pretty much had him saying yes. And we weren't even pitching to him to raise money. Like he found us out and said, I want to invest money. Are you guys looking to raise money? We're like, yes. He's like, can I invest? We're like, yeah, hell yeah. And so he invested in a personal capacity. And that's been, and I think that's a great example for how we've raised money in the past. Because most of the times people have tried the product and be like, huh, you're onto something. And I think the product does most of the sales for us, most of the communication for us. And that's been great. I think your product is doing all the heavy lifting in terms of raising a, <laughs> raising any kind of money. Yeah, yeah. So we, we cannot uh, not talk about Shark Tank. So tell me a little bit about your experience on Shark Tank. Okay, so you rational for Shark Tank, right? Both Nitin and I are quite uh, introverted people. We're not very... While Nitin does enjoy uh, the stage, he enjoys presentations. That's his forte. I am super camera shy. I am... I have stage fright. I, let's, let's, that's what it is. I have major stage fright. So the thought of going into Shark Tank gave me, like, I think it gave me like a loose tummy right up front. Just the thought of it. Uh, Nitin, on the other hand, was like, yeah, like, it's so embarrassing. We're not going to go. That's crazy. And then we were both like, you know what? Let's just apply, right? They're going to say no because we're alcohol in any case. So we applied. Then we got a call for the audition. And we're like, you know what, let's just go for the audition. It'll be a fun experience. They're going to say no anyways because it's alcohol. So we went, we opened up some meads. They tasted the meads during the audition. They loved it. We're like, yeah, the, the channel's going to say no. The channel said yes. They called us back. We went for the, and again, all this while we're like, should we go, should we not go? And finally we're like, man, if you think about it, this is maybe one of the few opportunities we will have in our lives or in the brand will have in its journey to come on TV for maybe like 10 to 15 minutes uninterrupted and be able to communicate the entire brand story. We're not pitching a campaign. We're pitching the entire thesis of why this brand exists. And uh, we're like, just for that alone, it just makes sense to go. And uh, I think the sharks were very astute when they figured out that we didn't necessarily want their money, but we were there for the marketing. Uh, which is why those shit-eating faces that we had, the grins that we had <laughs> right after. Uh, and I think... The experience was fantastic. Uh, they asked us to speak in Hindi. Nitin's from Mysore. He's like, yeah, like, will not, cannot. Uh, so it came to me to speak, give that first three-minute pitch in Hindi, which was gruesome. Uh, I still managed to pull it off. I had nightmares about it before 
the event. I, I had proper nightmares about it. But uh, the pitch went well. The rest of the pitch was pretty much, it was like a normal investor pitch, right? So after the first three minutes were done where I had to memorize those lines and get it over with, uh, or memorize the flow and get it over with, then the rest of the Q&A was pretty standard. That's something that Nitin and I have done like hundreds of times. And it wasn't a challenge at all because we've, I mean, every variation of that, that of those questions they've answered. But it was very interesting to see also from the perspective of a consumer, how it is behind the curtain in showbiz to see what goes on behind. And that was pretty awesome. And uh, great experience. 10 on 10 would definitely do it again. But yeah, but a lot better. So after, after Shark Tank, eh, did you see any kind of uh, up sales moving up in the right direction or it didn't actually make any so difference? We've seen a lot of increase in awareness for the category and uh, category of meat. Mm. And uh, this is something that I'm a huge believer in is that the category comes first, not, not necessarily the brand because... Think of it the Xerox way, right? You still call it, I'm going to a Xerox. I'm going to get a Xerox for this. Very rarely do we say a photocopy. And uh, it's the same idea with meads. Uh, moonshine and meads have to be synonymous. And only if we grow the category of meads will moonshine grow as well. So for me, what I, I was really like kicked about was that people actually now recognize meads. People have act, like, we've actually managed to put meads on the map. It's still a small corner on the map, right? But it's so much bigger than what it was. And uh, we've seen some uptick in sales for sure. Uh, but I'm hoping, I'm expecting that uptick to really come about in summer. Because uh, I think the episode aired in the, like in January, which is uh, historically the worst month for Alcobev in the country. And so we weren't really expecting much had to happen. Our followership on social media, of course, shot through the roof. The number of emails we get for jobs and distribution, that shot through the roof. And uh, hopefully now sales will shoot through the roof as well in the next few months as the country heats up and people start looking at cold beverages to consume. That is that's awesome. So today, what is stopping you from going pan-India? Like since you have, you know, a lot of distributors will be approaching yeah. you. And normal distribution, that is, you know, a large concern, finding the right distributors yeah. and things. So I'm very sure Shark Tank, you know, uh, got you a little bit more popular than you guys already were. So right now, what is stopping you from being present in 20 states? So, is it production? Is it quality or shelf life? None of those. It's just uh, okay. it's regulation. Because we're an excisable, okay. we're a product which comes under the ambit of the excise uh, department, okay. every state has its own excise rules and regulations. And so we okay. can't have the same pricing from state to state because the taxation structures, uh, the duty structures, uh, all of those change from state to state. And uh, that impacts what MRPs we can go at. That impacts what our margins will be. And there's so many other variables over there. And we've we launched in about, we were in two markets, Maharashtra and Goa. We lo we've launched in about four new markets and launching in two more in the next, in this month itself. So we'll be in eight, eight markets. And for Alcobel, that's enough. That's enough for us to have our hands full and maybe pull our hair out as well. Because, uh, except for Nathan, he's, he's bald. Uh, so what we want to do right now is consolidate in the markets we already are in and uh, have a little bit more depth, uh, not a little, a lot more depth in the markets we are in before we start spreading again. Uh, but currently we have a hands full and again, all the question of, it's a small team, we have limited bandwidth. Uh, the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. So we just want to focus on the markets we are already in and just like hammer it home there. That is fantastic. So tell me about the name Moonshine Meat. Okay. That is fantastic. So you remember when I first said that we started making the product at home? Uh, everyone thought they're going to go blind because, uh, I mean, I tried explaining that methanol production can only happen, I mean, if you distill it, right? Uh, there isn't enough methanol to make people go blind. But people kept asking, is this Moonshine? Is this Moonshine? And uh, we're like, no, 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 it's not distilled. It's just fermented. Try it out. You won't go blind. Look, we'll take a sip, you know, first and all of that. <laughs> and uh, finally, the name stuck. We're like, when we had to come up with the name of the brand, we're like, actually, Moonshine is a pretty cool name. And I think for us, it also is a throwback to our origin stories. And uh, like with all comic book fans, who doesn't like a good origin story? So, so that is 
fantastic. So I, I, I can imagine a year or two later, people going in and asking for moonshine when they actually mean meads. They're asking for moonshine because that's literally the only name they know, like the Xerox, right? You'll be, I, I can literally see that happening now. Uh, and I love the fact that you're focusing on the category growing rather than just your yeah. brand growing, right? So that is, uh, it, that, that kind of thinking will put you on the map and will make you, you know, leaders because many people are just looking at themselves and they're trying to just grow their own yeah. piece. But very, very few people are trying to develop a category, uh, right? Which is very, very difficult, uh, right? So right now, a lot of the heavy lifting is on your shoulders because it's not just for you to create a necessity for your product, but just for your category in general. Like many people may not know uh, what is a mean, yeah. you know, the, the barrier of trying out a new product, they may not be comfortable doing it. So there's a lot of heavy lifting, which you will yeah. do, which will probably wave, wave you know, the others. And when the others kind of follow it, it's a little easier for them, but... Hopefully you've gone far ahead and on quite big where even if you have a few competitors, you know, you'll actually say more than exactly. that. Exactly. Because yeah, so. a rising tide floats all both, right? So if we if the category does well, everyone will do well. And that's fine. Because uh, we're also another thing I'd like to point out, Ashwin, is that our the entire thesis of the brand exists that there is a white space which exists for a consumer who transitions from his first drinking journey, right? He goes from drinking carbonated sweet colas to carbonated bitter beer, right? How did he go from sweet to bitter? Where is, you know, what happened in that middle space, right? And we believe there's a huge space available, huge white space available for flavorful beverages. And that is the world in which we operate because that's the thesis for everything we do. Like it's, whatever we make, it has to be flavorful. It has to be delicious. We don't believe in acquired tastes, uh, it should be tasty right out of the bottle, right? Uh, and uh, again, that same uh, same thesis also applies to the kind of names we have for our products. We don't call, no fancy names for our SKUs. A salted coca mead is called a salted coca mead. A grilled pineapple mead could have been called like, like Jamaican something. But, man, we don't want to confuse the customer any further. It's, it's got grilled pineapples in there. It's, we're going to call it the grilled pineapple mead. What you see is what you get. So, I, I love the clean label approach. Uh, so, what are the different flavors that you have? So, we have uh, three flagships which are available throughout the year. There's the apple cider mead, is the coffee mead, and the traditional mead. Uh, then we have uh, what we call the mead lab series, which are again, and this also started because we are we started off as home brewers. And if you told me that Rowan, you have to make three meads for the rest of your life, I'd be like, I might as well shut the company down and go home because I'd rather shoot myself. So uh, the Meal Lab series is just us expressing ourselves and, you know, taking the roots of home brewing and basically making it, you know, more systemic. So we do these small batches with seasonal produce. So, for example, a guava chili mead, once guava season's over, it's done. We're not going to make it again. But one thing is that we don't use any artificial flavors. We use real guavas. We use bhut chilaka chilies. We've done a mango chili mead. My current favorite is something called the grilled pineapple mead. Uh, pineapples grilled over coal, then put inside a mead. And uh, grilled and smoked over coal. So we smoke it also slightly. Uh, so it's like pineapple smokiness, uh, super fantastic. Uh, we've done a salted kokum mead. So that's actually like drinking like a nice kokum sharbat, but with salt, perfect for a hot summer day. Uh, we're just we're launching the hopped mead in another two days. Uh, in fact, I was in the mead day and the stocks were being loaded up into the truck. So it'll hit the distributor tomorrow and the market day after. So we launched the hopped mead, which is going to be a slightly bitter mead. And that's what I love about meads. It's so versatile. We've done we've done sweet meads, we've done spicy meads, we've done salty meads, we've done sour meads. And now after the hopped mead, we would have done a bitter mead. I think the only challenge left would be a umami mead. And uh, yeah, okay. uh, let's see how that goes. So is that something you are going towards, like creating an umami um, mead? So be... we've tried, we've done experiments with uh, wasabi and soy. Okay, uh, oh. didn't turn out very well, uh, but still <laughs> worth uh, more trials for sure. That has been on the way. So uh, I saw your logos and I saw some of the, uh, you know, graphics on your bottles. Tell me the story behind that. So when we started in 2018, uh, we were so clueless as to who the consumer was because we launched mm. at a price point which was, we were about 60 rupees more expensive than the most expensive Indian bottled beverage and about 100, mm. maybe 50 rupees cheaper than the cheapest imported beverage. 
And so we were in this like no man's land that no one had existed before. And we were creating a new category. So we didn't know who the TG was. And we thought the TG is going to be 35 plus. So we went for a super minimalist, almost Scandinavian approach to our branding. It was very minimalist and in, we really loved it. But we also realized that there were problems with it because the TG turned out to be 21 to 30. Okay. And uh, once within five months, we're like, okay, we got the TG completely wrong. We went back to uh, our current designer and we're like, can you... Uh, change can you give us like an architecture because the previous branding was also very text heavy and we wanted something visual and because we're so craft inside the bottle we wanted to have craft outside the bottle as well so we wanted to work with different artists and have labels done by different artists but and I think this was different and unique because we told the designer that we don't want to have artwork and slap a logo on the artwork, right? We want somehow our identity to be integral to the artwork itself. And so the architecture he came up with is the front of the label is just like a circle and moonshine beneath it. And we tell artists, please go ahead and overlap the circle by about 20 to 25%. And so, because that's the way our identity becomes integral with the artwork itself. And so that's led to some very unique and very interesting art and uh, again, it's a pleasure to work with artists and to, you know, create something because we tell them what the products like, or sometimes we even give them the sample versions of the product and say, this is what you're making the product uh, a label for. And we've had some artists like uh, Anirudh, who's a big fat minimalist, who's done the, the mandalas and sacred games. He did the label for the coffee mead. Anand, uh, he's a comic book artist. He did the label for the apple mead. Uh, so again, uh, and each label is so unique, but when you line them all up, when you when you take a step back and look at all of them together, you see uh, the artwork being, as somebody else put it very nicely, freshly consistent, right? And uh, I think that's what I really enjoy about it. And because each bottle is a work of art, like, and it's crafted inside the bottle as well as outside. That is fantastic. Okay, so last question uh, for the session. What advice would you give somebody entering this space? Firstly, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in all seriousness, uh, do it, but be, uh, man, fill up your stores with tenacity, right? Take that tenacity meter or go to that tenacity pump and fill up your tank with as much tenacity as you can because it's a tough journey. And uh, I think the tenacious will be victorious. Uh, and I think that's the main piece of advice I have for any entrepreneur, actually, not just this space. Uh, running a business isn't easy. Uh, it's firefight after firefight, day in, day out. Right? You can build up systems, you can build up processes so the firefights reduce, uh, that the team can, you know, you build up a team that can manage the firefights for you. But at the end of the day, the final accountability is yours, the final responsibility is yours. And uh, it takes a toll on you. And if you don't have the tenacity to sustain and, uh, you know, persevere through the dips, uh, it's going to be very tough. So I think tenacity is the main, I think, requirement of an entrepreneur, whether this case or any that other. Is, that's, I think, a perfect point, uh, you know, for us to end this episode. Uh, Rohan, thank you so much for sharing so openly and, you know, giving us a peek behind uh, the meadery behind your brand and about yourself and i wish you guys the very best and i'm hoping to see meads more common uh, meads in every store meads at every party meads in every fridge and i don't think you should stop till that happens thank you so much ashwin yeah. i really do appreciate so, wish it. you uh, more time we the very best thank you ashwin i really really do appreciate you taking the time out as well thanks thanks a lot so guys that was rohan rihani who was a co-founder of moonshine meadery if you haven't tried a meet yet, go online, go to Moonshine Meet, you know, go find Moonshine Meet online, find the closest retailer and order one today because I think it's going to be something uh, new that you're going to try and I think it's going to blow your mind and you never know it may become your next favorite beverage. Anyways, till next time, please have a fantastic day. Thanks, everyone.